It took almost an entire year from the start of the Odin campaign for the Odin Light to start shipping out to backers, but it is finally happening. I thought we could mark this day by finally doing a full review of the device, including covering things that people have been asking me about for a long time, like showing how it stacks up to the more popular Odin Base and Odin Pro. My name is Taki, and this is my review of the Odin Light. If you enjoy content like this, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It really helps out a lot. Now, normally at this point in a review, I would talk about the screen, controls, and build quality, but I already did all of that in my Odin Pro review, and those things are essentially the same with a small caveat. If you want more information on those points, you can take a look at the card listed on screen, or you can check out my Odin Pro video linked in the description box below. The TLDR is that the older screen is one of the best, if not the best in this market, but they do have a newer one that I have not yet seen. The screen in the device that I have is of an extremely limited batch that almost no one will get, but I will still end up talking about it later in this video. If the final screen ends up being significantly worse in the aspects of picture quality, I will make sure to add a note about it in the pinned comment. As for the controls, I am personally a fan of everything, but I like the analog R2 and L2 the most. There are very few Android devices with analog shoulder buttons, and these are perfect for the types of things that I want to do with my Odin Lite. The build quality is also pretty much the best in this market, and there is nothing outside of the other Odins that even comes close. Again, specific details about all three of these points are in my Odin Pro review. What I do want to go over is a quick spec recap. The Odin Lite comes with the Dimensity 900 chipset. This gives us access to two powerful Cortex-A78 cores that can handle just about anything that you could throw at them, and our mid-range GPU also puts up good numbers in high-end emulation. The device that I have here comes with 4GB of LPDDR4X RAM and 64GB of UFS 2.1 storage, and it is the configuration that I would recommend to most people, but they do have upgrades available for 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage. The only other thing that I want to point out is that our battery is very big for how efficient this processor is, and we will talk more about battery life on this device later in this video. The base configuration that I have comes in at $198 on Indiegogo. This is already a great price for what you're getting here, but it was cheaper than this for a long time last year. If you were willing to throw a Hail Mary when this campaign started, you could have grabbed one of these for $164, $174, or $184 depending on how early you backed. It's also important to note that the people who will be receiving Odin Lights around the time this review is published are going to be those early backers and they got a crazy good deal. To put things into perspective, let's take a look at the current crop of Android handhelds priced low to high. On the top of our list, we have the RP2 Plus at $99. Moving down the list, we have the Powkitty A20, the RG353P, Powkitty X18S, Odin Light, RG552, Odin Base, Odin Pro, and the GPD XD Plus coming in at $340. The Odin Lite is smack dab in the middle of this list, but I want to order this list by price versus performance. Before I do that, I want to just say that I went about this two different ways, and both ways gave me almost the exact same list. I started off by setting the Odin Lite as the baseline, and then judged the performance of other devices compared to the Odin Lite and how much the Odin Lite would cost for that performance level. For the second way, I made a chart of all of the handhelds on this list and then awarded points for being able to do specific emulation tasks from my emulation tier video. These would be things like most GameCube and Wii games at higher than 1x resolution, or some PS2. I then took the cost and divided it by the number of points. With that said, here is our price versus performance chart. At the top of our list, we have the Odin Lite, followed by the RP2 Plus, and then the Odin Base, the X18S, the Odin Pro, and the GPD XD Plus. But this is based on the device being sold for $340 after the IgG campaign is over. If the price increases, this would fall far down the list. Under that, we have the Powkitty A20, the RG552, and the RG353P. I don't think it'll come as a surprise to anyone who saw my emulation video, but the Odin Lite is currently the king of price versus performance out of all of the Android handhelds. It is a tier 5 gaming handheld for under $200, with only one other handheld beating it in performance without any doubt, but it does that for $140 more money. Now you could make the argument that the other Odin devices technically have more performance because they can run Windows and as such have access to Windows games, but this list is focusing on emulation ability versus cost. 
We will talk more about those points in a later section. I think that most people watching this video that also followed the roller coaster IgG campaign know that the Odin Light experienced huge delays over issues with HDMI video out. Up until filming this video, I have never seen an Odin Light with working video out. I have been waiting to get my hands on an Odin Light with working HDMI just so I could make this review video. I own way too many Odins as it is and I don't want or need any more, but it seems kind of wasteful for me to ask for an Odin Light to film this video when it could go to someone that has been waiting for their order. Thankfully, someone agreed to accept an open Odin Light so I can finally test HDMI out without feeling bad. So, here's the moment of truth. As you can see, the video out works. Like the screen in the 845 Odins, this is not completely off when it's used like this, but you do have the option of keeping the backlight on if you want. I also made sure that both the 1080p and the 720p options work correctly. The only issue that I found is that the audio isn't as good as it should be. One of the highlights of this device is that it has active and passive cooling. The other Odin models also have those two things, but they go further on this device because the SoC is more efficient. As we saw from my head-to-head -head Genshin Impact test, there is a gap of over 20 Celsius between both models. That was kind of an extreme case, so let's go over some thermal stats for different scenarios. In scenario one, you are playing some N64 for about 30 minutes or so with no fan on because you want the device to be dead silent. In this situation, you'd be looking at the following temperature breakdown. In the second scenario, you are playing some PSP, but this time you're using the fan set to quiet mode. Here is how the fan would sound under that mode. In this situation, you'd be looking at the following temperature breakdown. For our final scenario, we are going to do two actions. For this, we are going to be loading up a copy of Final Fantasy X for the PS2 and we are going to play it for about 30 minutes or so with no fan. After that, we are going to completely cool off the device and then do the same thing again with the fan set to auto. Just for reference, this is how the fan would sound when it is set to auto after the full 30 minutes. And finally, here is our temperature breakdown. As you can see, this device does not really need a fan to get good performance, but it does give a clear benefit if you want your device to run as cool as possible. I tend to leave my device on silent mode since it isn't that loud and it can adequately serve my needs. If I ever want to use higher performance modes for high-end emulation, I still have the auto and turbo fan settings to use. The next thing that I want to talk about on this device is the battery life. This is something that I have only mentioned in passing here or there, so it feels about right to do an in-depth look at it. If you followed this campaign when it first started, you'd know that the Odin Light was supposed to come with a smaller battery than the one it has today. Another thing that you need to know is that this is a mid-range 6 nanometer SoC, and this comes with two benefits. The first is that it is fairly efficient thanks to the process node, but more importantly, the amount of power that it can consume under any load is greatly reduced because it only has two performance cores. When you take these two things coupled with the fact that we have a 6,600 milliamp hour battery, you are getting absurdly good battery life. Let's take a look at power consumption averages for a variety of emulation tasks. As you can see, you are getting very good battery life even if you intend to only use the Odin Light for high-end emulation. Unfortunately, the story does not stop here. These battery life measurements were taken with what can be considered to be the second batch of screens for Odin devices. The first and second batches are the exact same IPS panel with the only differences being in their color temperature. The third batch of screens that will go out will not get you these battery life numbers. If we adjust this chart to take into account the power consumption of that new panel, this is the effect. As you can see, this has a disappointing impact on one of my favorite parts of this processor and this device. The new screen uses 300 milliamps of additional power on average over the screens that have been used thus far. This might seem like a small number, but power consumption is additive and this is a big load to take on across the board. What can the Odin Light do when it comes to emulation? Well, 
I have done a rather in-depth video on this topic that you can watch by clicking the card linked on screen now. What I will do is quickly go over the types of systems that you can emulate on this device and the kinds of settings that you can use. I put together this helpful chart so you can see everything at a glance. I didn't include any tier 1 or tier 2 systems for this because this device is overkill for that. For N64, we can upscale games to 1080p and take advantage of the wide adjusted setting to fill out the screen. In PlayStation 1, we can use 4 to 5x native resolution with widescreen hacks and PGXP. For Dreamcast, we can increase the rendering resolution to 1440p and we can use widescreen hacks. For PSP, most games are going to be at 4x native resolution for 1080p scaling, but more demanding ones like God of War will need 3x. For 3DS, the resolution that we can use depends on the game, but we can use 1 to 4x native resolution. In GameCube, we can use 3x native resolution for 1080p with widescreen hacks enabled. In Wii, more games are going to run at 3x resolution, but you might need to bump down to 2x for heavier ones. When it comes to PlayStation 2, most games are going to run well at 2x resolution or higher, but you will need to bump down to 1x for demanding titles. And finally, Switch is currently limited to only 2D games on the Odin Lite. For the next section, we are going to cover something that people have been asking me about for a long time. A head-to-head -head comparison against the Odin Lite and the Odin Pro. If you watched my video on the GPD XD+, then some of what I will cover here will not come as any surprise. As I showed in my first look video, thermal performance is drastically different between these two devices, with the Odin Lite having a clear lead. This on its own isn't really that valuable because you can't have a weak device that doesn't generate any heat, so let's look specifically at emulation performance. Let's start with PlayStation 2. For this system, there are some games that will run better on the Lite and some that will run better on the Pro. I picked three games that are about equal on both devices so you can see the difference in the performance. We are not using any underclocking for this and each device is using the most optimal settings possible. Now, let's move over to Switch emulation. Let's start with Bastion. On the Odin Pro, less of this game is broken, and you can see what I mean if I open up the pause menu. In this example, the Odin Lite has about a 10 FPS lead over the Odin Pro. The Odin Pro can probably outperform the Odin Lite, but it would need a setting to set the CPU clocks to max frequency. Without that setting, the Odin Lite has about 20 FPS in this situation. Next, we have Binding of Isaac. In this game, the Odin Pro comes out ahead. Now let's look at GameCube performance. Both of these devices can pretty much handle anything that you'd throw at them for GameCube, so we may have to focus on power consumption or increasing the rendering resolution up high to see the difference. In this first game, both devices have no problem at 2x resolution. 
If we change to 3x, the FPS drops by a third on the Odin light. If we step outside, the gap between the devices decreases, but the Odin light only manages to get around an average of 29 FPS, while the Odin is a solid 30. That being said, the average power consumption is higher on the Odin Pro by around 30%. Let's take a look at a harder game to run. Here is Metroid Prime 2 at 2x native resolution. And finally, let's look at Wii performance. When it comes to Xenoblade Chronicles, both of these devices can run the game at 3x resolution, so we have to focus on power consumption instead. The Odin Pro takes an extra 300 milliamps of additional power to match the Odin Lite in this game. When we look at Skyward Sword, both devices can run the game without issues at 2x native resolution. That being said, the Odin Pro can actually go to 3x for this game. If we change both devices to 3x, the FPS on the light drops to 18 out of 30, and the FPS drops to 26 out of 30 on the Pro. The important thing here is to note that the Odin Pro is using a lot more power in this extreme situation. What are the key takeaways from these tests? Both of these devices are fairly close in performance with only some minor edge cases that favor one over the other. In situations where both devices are doing the same job well, the light will save a bit more power doing so. There's one final point that I want to go over in this comparison, and that is sound quality. I've already talked about the fact that I like the audio DSP in the 845 Odins because they have a great low end to them, but I don't expect that the Odin Lite will match it because I don't think anyone paid any attention to this part of the product. So for this, we are going to bring back my Switch Lite comparison test across the three devices this time to see which one is the best. As you can see, both of the Odin devices exceed the Switch Lite in this test, but I did notice a difference between the two of them that isn't obvious if we use these retro games. Based on what I am hearing, the Odin Pro has a richer low end to it, and you can hear that lack of bass in the Odin Lite. I think the best chance I have to showcase this difference would be to use some songs with clearly defined low end frequencies. If you have headphones, now would be a good time to use them so you can hear the differences for yourself. I'll start by playing the clip by itself so you can hear how it should sound, and again, headphones would greatly help. Now let's play that selection on the Odin Pro. And finally, here is the Odin Light. Hopefully you can notice the difference between the two when you focus on the bass notes and the kick drum. I have one more clip that might be easier to judge with clear bass notes. Let's start off with the section by itself. And now the Odin Light. and now the Odin Pro. So yeah, the Odin Pro clearly has a better DSP, which is not surprising to me because Qualcomm configured it by themselves for AYN. AYN says they're gonna improve this in an OTA, but I personally feel like the Odin Pro will always have the sound that I like the most. All that being said, if I did not own an Odin Pro, I would probably not have an issue with the Odin Lights DSP. Before we go over my pros and cons of this device, I have one more thing that I want to talk about that I could not fit in anywhere else. When AYN first decided to use the D900 processor for the Odin Light, I thought that it would be the best version of Odin. There was a time when the Odin Base and the Odin Pro were a lot worse than they should have been, and it did not seem like the company had any hope of turning it around. As you know, 
That version of Odin uses a Snapdragon 845 processor, and we've already seen how capable it is when it is overclocked and able to use active cooling. These two things allow it to outperform SD845 phones, but there was a time when it was much worse than an 845 phone. As a result of this, the device was not good under normal operation and it fell short of an 845 phone when it was overclocked. Because of this, I thought that the Odin Lite would be the best version of this device because it still had the ability to outperform the old faulty Odin base even if AYN was only able to achieve a fraction of the available performance in the D900. Thankfully, the issues with the 845 were able to be rectified, which closed the gap between these two models, but this is why I was always the most hopeful about the Odin Lite model more than anything from this company. Now let's go over my pros and cons of the Odin Lite. The first and most important pro is probably the price versus performance of this device. It is currently the best thing on the market that you can buy that can emulate the most things possible for the asking price. The second pro for me are the color options. This model has the cheapest access to the SNES color scheme, which I think is the best Odin version that is commercially available at this time. I like the analog R2 and L2 triggers, and I think they make GameCube and a lot of other systems a lot more enjoyable to play compared to other options. I like the efficiency of the system, which includes the thermal performance and the battery life. On these two points alone, this is easily the best gaming handheld on the market of any platform. If I ever need to pare down my handheld collection, I like that the Odin Lite can easily serve as my only emulation handheld. I could use this for everything that I want to play and I would not feel like I was having to make a compromise. This might not be a pro for everyone, but I like that this device has 4G support and I like that I could use it as a phone in a pinch. Finally, I like the build quality and the ergonomics of this device. When it comes to cons, there are not that many things that I do not like. On the top of my list would have to be the software options available to this device compared to the other Odins. I think even when this kernel is completely open sourced, there is little hope that we will ever get access to Linux distros on this device due to the amount of work required to bring up this board. I don't like that the battery life will not be as good as it was supposed to be now that the company is on to its third batch of screens. That screen uses more power than the screens in any Odin device that exists to this point, and it is a big letdown since battery life was one of my favorite parts of the D900 since last year. I also do not like the color temperature of the screens that were used in this limited production batch. It is bluer than the screen in my Odin Pro, or any other Odin that I have for that matter. I don't know if this was changed a long time ago, and I just never heard about it, but I don't like it as much as I like the original one. If I didn't have the original one to compare, I probably wouldn't have this as a con, but I do, and this is worse. The stock of this screen is limited to only a few hundred of this model, so this point should only be valid for a week or so. To be fair, other devices have these kinds of problems. I have five Miu Mini devices, and all of them have different color temperatures and color saturation. And finally, the audio DSP is not as good as it is on my Odin Bass and Odin Pro. The speakers are still good, they're just not as good as what I've come to expect. I have used my Odin Bass and Odin Pro extensively over the last year, and it was immediately obvious to me that the Odin Lite didn't sound as good. Anyway, as for my recommendations for this device, I think this is the best thing available right now if you want to emulate systems above the PS1 era. If you already own another Odin device, there's not really any reason to buy this one outside of collecting, but if you do not own an 845 Odin and you don't care about Windows or Linux support, this would be the only version that I would buy as a consumer. It can do everything that those Odins can do with better battery life and heat, but it does so with less access to software. That aside, it is simply a much better value than everything else on the market. The Odin Pro is still my favorite gaming handheld, but this is the one that I would have bought with my own money if I wasn't a reviewer. But let me know your thoughts down below. Are you considering buying one of these for yourself, or do you already have something that suits your needs? Personally, I would be upset that I did not grab one of these when they were $170, because that is a ridiculous value for how this device turned out. Happy gaming, everyone. Takio.